Thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast. We're live on the third day of the 2020 International Web-Based Neurosurgery Congress. We're streaming on YouTube Live too. We have the honor today of having Dr. Ajit Thomas. Dr. Thomas is a cerebral vascular neurosurgeon, director of endovascular and operative neurovascular surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and associate professor of neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School. Today, Professor Thomas is going to share his lecture, Evaluation and Management of Dural Arteriovenous Fistulas. Please type your questions on the Q&A section. We will read them at the end of Dr. Thomas' presentation. Welcome, Dr. Thomas, and thank you. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about dural AV fistulas of the brain, diagnosis and management. I want to first start by expressing my gratitude to the Brain and Instrument Institute and the amazing people that work with us, my partners, Dr. Chris Ogilvy and Dr. Justin Moore, and the amazing research team that we have that also helped me put together this talk. I specifically want to thank Dr. Mauricio Rivera's from Colombia, who gave me this opportunity to present at this conference, Dr. Christopher Ogilvy and Dr. Moore, Dr. Puri, who works at UMass, who has graciously allowed us to use some of his patient data, and Dr. Yosuke Akamatsu from Japan, our research fellow who uh, helped put this talk together. So I first start uh, by defining an intracranial dural AV fistula. It's basically an abnormal connection between arteries and veins within the dura. About 10 to 15% of intracranial vascular malformations that we encounter are dural AV fistulas, and they're typically encountered in middle-aged adults, and we consider it an acquired disease rather than a congenital disease. As we all know, the dura matter has been described since Egyptian times in BC 1400, it basically was described initially as a tough outer membrane surrounding the brain. This tough fibrous membrane covers the brain and the spinal cord and lines the inner surface of the skull. It's the outermost of the three meninges that surround the brain and spinal cord, the other being the arachnoid and the pia. The middle meningeal artery supplies this membrane, or most of it, and forms arcades around the sagittal sinus. Uh, this has been well described by Dr. Al Roten's group, and you can see how these arcades form around the sagittal sinus. So these are branches of the middle meningeal artery, and you can see how these arcades are forming around the sagittal sinus. And when you open the sagittal sinus, you actually see that these arteries or branches of the middle mandible artery actually lie within the walls of the sinus. And that's why a lot of these uh, dual AV fistulas involving the middle mandible arteries drain into the sinus. And it's oftentimes not directly into the sinus, but the communication may be within the walls of the sinus. And the arteriovenous malformations form from the enlargement of normal arteriovenous anastomosis within the dura. We oftentimes don't see these on an angiogram, but when you do a histological analysis, you can see these connections between the arteries and the veins. As to why the dura matter, why does the dura matter have such a rich vascular network? And why do they specifically have arteriovenous shunts? And what is the role of the dura other than being a protective barrier? It's hard to imagine why a protective barrier would have need for such complexity. These are all questions that we need to answer in the future. And there's a lot of interest in the dura now because of its role in middle meningeal artery embolization for subdural hematoma. We also know that a lot of the lymphatics course through this area. So the pathology of dural AVFs remain unclear. 
we do think that there is some form of venous thrombosis that predates the formation of endural AV fistula and it promotes the expression of vascular growth factors. Other factors that could be involved would be mechanical injury like trauma or surgery, inflammation, which is in examples would be infection and radiation, a hypercoagulable state such as pregnancy or the use of oral uh, contraceptive medications. But we all have a general consensus that the majority of these lesions are acquired whatever will be the mechanism. The pathophysiology is interesting because if you really look at it, though there are various reasons that result in the formation of endural AVM, the manifestations vary. For example, if you have increased venous pressure, you can just get a focal neurologic deficit just from venous congestion. And if this venous pressure is sustained, you could potentially uh, end with a hemorrhage if there is leptomeningeal or retrograde cortical venous drainage. If there is a large venous varix, you can get an aqueductal obstruction which results in hydrocephalus. If the dural AVM has increased generalized venous pressure, that results in increased intracranial hypertension, papilledema. If you have multiple feeders that are recruited, then you can have what you call neighborhood symptoms. This would be, an example would be pulsatile tinnitus or cavernous sinus syndrome, where you find that there is um, uh, uh, um, in interference with the normal functioning of the extraocular cranial nerves. And rarely you can get spontaneous thrombosis, which can result in other manifestations like hemorrhage. There are various ways to classify them. The more accepted classification systems are the Cognard classification and the Borden classification. The Cognard type 1 is an anti-grade dural venous drainage. Type 2A is retrograde drainage. Type 3, 2B is anti-grade and cortical venous drainage, which has a high risk of hemorrhage, 10 to 20%. Cortical venous reflux with no ectasia, which has a 40% risk of hemorrhage. Cortical venous reflux with ectasia, which has a 65% hemorrhage. Now, this is different from 2A because here, the drainage is into the dural venous sinus and the meningeal veins, but not into the cortical veins. And type 5 would be a separate class by itself, which basically has spinal venous drainage. The Borden is much simpler to use. Um, Borden was a resident when he, uh, when he suggested this classification. It was originally called borden Schuckart classification, but now it mainly reflects his contribution. So, the anti-grade or retrograde flow, type 1 would be anti-grade or retrograde flow into dural venous sinus or meningeal vein. Type 2 would be above and cortical venous drainage. Type 3 would be only cortical venous drainage. And what is the natural history of this? If you really consider it, a lot of it depends on the drainage pattern. The overall natural history is a 15% annual risk of hemorrhage or neurological impairment. But that is the overall risk. But if you think about it, if you don't have cortical venous drainage, the risk is much lower. Uh, the most recent uh, study from Gross, Brad Gross from the University of Pittsburgh, suggests that Borden type 2 has a 6% risk, and a Borden type 3 has a 10% risk, with a 21% risk if there is venous ectasia. Now, what happens to patients who have uh, just Borden type 1? What is the risk of them eventually developing cortical venous drainage? 
I think it's approximately 2% based on what you have uh, in retrospective studies. They've not been prospectively looked at. The severity of symptom is associated with the cortical venous drainage. So if you look at Borden type 1, the hemorrhage risk is less than 1% per year. Borden type 2 is 74 to 8%. And then Borden type 3 would be much higher. And so if you, if you look at the cornea, and you can again see that having cortical venous reflux increases the risk of hemorrhage. In a progression of benign intracranial dural AV fistulas, the Toronto group has provided us some data. Their original paper was in 2002, and then they followed it up subsequently in 2010. Um, so a benign dural AV fistula was thought to carry a 2% risk of developing cortical venous reflux. But if you look at their more updated paper, you can see that they have suggested that this risk is approximately about 4%. When you talk about the treatments for dural AV fistulas, there is transarterial embolization, there is transvenous embolization, there's surgical interruption of the cortical venous drainage, combined endovascular and surgical treatment, and radiosurgery. Our experience has been primarily with um, the transarterial, transvenous embolization, and surgical methods. We, are, we have limited experience with radiosurgery in, in, with our group. Between 2009 and 2019, we um, treated um, 68 intracranial dural AV fistulas with transarterial embolization. Um, and we used onyx for most of these patients, which is ethylene vinyl alcohol copolymer. And if you look at the transarterial embolizations, you can see that most of these were men, with women forming only about 38%. And the average age or the median age was 62. So it seems to be a disease of the middle-aged person. And about one-third of these patients presented with intracerebral hemorrhage, intracranial hemorrhage. And you can see the in the non-hemorrhagic group, they presented with tinnitus, headache, seizures, and some of them were asymptomatic and picked up from routine imaging. The location we classified into group A, B, and C, which I will describe to you later, uh, the group A was mostly the cerebral convexity, and that formed the majority, which was 63%. Type 1, Borden, was about 10%. Type 2 was about, sorry, type 1 was about uh, 15%. Type 2 was similar. And type 3, which is uh, cortical venous drainage alone, seemed to be the vast majority of patients because they are the ones who become symptomatic. Now, going on to describe how we classified the groups, it is based on the paper from Martins, which is from Dr. Roten's group, published in 2004. We looked at the entire cerebral convexity, the lateral segment of the cerebellar convexity, and the FOX, which is supplied predominantly by the middle meningeal artery. And then we had the second group, which was the cranial base which was supplied by both internal and external cord arteries. And then we had group C, which was the medial cerebellar convexity, and uh, which was predominantly supplied by the posterior meningeal artery. Now, if you look at the location, as I mentioned, um, it was primarily in the group A, or the cerebral convexity uh, or the lateral cerebellar convexity formed two-thirds of these patients. Then we went on to look at the specific artery which supplied these fistulas. If you look at group A, which is a cerebral, which is a cerebral convexity, you can see the FOX. You'll see that the middle meningeal artery supply is involved in the supply in 81%. 
compared to the group B where it is a smaller percent and when you come to group C it's even even smaller. The other artery that supplies a lot of this is the occipital artery. You can see that the occipital artery supplied at least two-thirds of this. Whereas in the in the other groups it's much smaller. And then when you come to the the meningohypophyseal trunk or the internal cord artery, you can see that the group B has a significant supply from it, along with the uh, uh, along with the other arteries. So what you find with the group B is that branches of the external and internal cord arteries supply it. And when you come to group C, you find that the posterior meningeal artery a significant supply, do you see this? 77.8%. And there are difficulties with embolizing the posterior meningeal artery as I'm going to show, but what I want to show you is another piece of information here that though the posterior meningeal artery supplies it, the middle meningeal artery still supplies it in more than 50% of patients. There's also supply from the occipital artery. Now, so if you basically describe it, the supply, you can see group A is supplied by the middle meningeal, the occipital artery, and some of the internal cord artery branches. Whereas when you come to the posterior group, you can see that it's predominantly the middle meningeal artery, but there's also supply from the ascending pharyngeal, the middle meningeal artery, and the occipital artery. Now, when you look at how did we access these fistulas for embolization, you can see that the middle meningeal artery was used in the majority of patients for um, the group A, and this resulted in complete obliteration, versus group B, where you can see that it's a smaller group, where the occipital artery was accessed, and again, the middle meningeal artery was accessed. And when you come look at the successful embolization in the posterior meningeal artery, you can in the posterior in group C, you can see that we use the middle meningeal artery, the occipital artery, and the ascending pharyngeal artery in, in one case here. So for group A, it seems relatively straightforward in the sense that we try through the middle meningeal artery first, but when it comes to group B and group C, we have to use more uh, varied approaches. So what is the outcome of transarterial embolization? We were able to obtain complete obliteration in about three-fourths of the patients, whereas we found that the MMA was perforated. We had a few complications. There was a middle meningeal artery perforation, which was asymptomatic. This happened in two out of uh, 68 patients. We did have some morbidity from a stroke, and I will explain that later. The uh, MMA perforation was asymptomatic. We just sealed it with onyx. The cerebellar, there was a cerebellar infarction because the onyx had migrated into an intact petrosal vein. And this patient had ataxia with a final modified Rankin score of one. Um, there was a patient who had an MCO occlusion during an ophthalmic artery embolization, and that patient's modified Rankin score a final modified Rankin score was three. So these are the two complications we had during this procedure. And if you look at what, what was the major factor which predicted a complete fistula obliteration after transarterial onyx embolization, you find that the use of middle meningeal artery access and abordant type three was associated with complete obliteration. So you can see if it's a type 3 borden, the p-value was 0 0.054. So it's very close to significance here. And the middle meningeal artery was 0 0.024. Uh, and then when you do a multivariant logistic regression analysis, you find that, again, these are the two factors that are most important to predict complete obliteration. 
Now I want to show you a few examples. So this is an 80-year-old male who came in with speech arrest and an arterial venous fistula. And what you see is the middle meningeal artery supplies this entire dural AV fistula and you can see there's a branch of the middle meningeal artery posteriorly here. This, sorry, anteriorly here, there's a posterior branch here. And interestingly, they supply two different areas, form a fistula in two different areas, and finally drain into a common vein. So this is the, this is the artery going up here, this is the fistula point, and again there's a fistula point here, but both the veins eventually come in here and drain into this common vein. The other interesting thing to see is that this vein, venous drainage is all to the opposite side. You see the middle meningeal artery is supplying it from the right side. And like I mentioned before and showed you the picture, the, it seems like the fistula point is all within the sagittal sinus. See, this is where the fistula is. But the venous drainage is to the other hemisphere. And then you can see how it forms all these tortuous a cactic cortical venous drain, drainage. <clears throat> now, when you're 80 years old, the question is, is there a role for intervention? And I think there is a role because, uh, as you saw from the natural history data, these uh, cortical venous drainage, along with these ectactic veins, increase the risk of hemorrhage. And uh, embolizing this is a fairly straightforward procedure. You can see how we got into the right middle meningeal artery. This is a final onyx cast. And you can see how we have eventually got the onyx into the draining vein. So remember there were two points where we drained into, uh, where the fistula was, but there was a final vein into which it drained. And the key objective of all these embolizations is to get your onyx into this uh, draining vein. And when you've done that, that's a successful embolization because the rest of the feeders then disappear. So this is a final angiogram after the obliteration. You can see how the middle meningeal artery, you see the branches, there's one branch here and the other branch you can see faint marking of it here. But there's no early venous drainage anymore and the patient has been cured. This is a, an example of a 55-year-old male who came in with a seizure and had a type 3 Borden fistula. And you can see this is a transverse sinus fistula, and which is predominantly supplied by the middle meningeal artery, the uh, occipital artery. And there's also some supply from the posterior meningeal artery. But it then drains into a vein, which uh, eventually is draining cortically almost like um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a vein of Labe, but a very large vein that drains anteriorly. And you can see that initially uh, we attempted to embolize it to the middle meningeal artery. And you can see also to the uh, occipital artery here. But the middle meningeal artery was what was successful and you can see that it was completely obliterated. So these are classic examples of patients who were uh, embolized to the middle meningeal artery. If you look at it, you can see how the, this is the, it, it gets into the fistula and then goes into the draining vein here. And once that happens, all the other feeders going into it basically just thrombose off. And this is the final result. There's no fistula here anymore. Uh, this is an example of a torcular dual AV fistula. He's a 67-year-old male who came in with tinnitus, bored in type 3. He had a feeder from a middle meningeal artery and an occipital artery and from the posterior meningeal artery. <clears throat> so if you look at the AP view, you can see the location of the fistula is over here. And on the lateral view, you see the middle meningeal artery coming up here and you can see that goes posteriorly and then you see the draining vein here. <clears throat> you see there's some supply from the occipital artery. There's also some supply from the posterior meningeal artery. Uh, 
which you do not see on this image. Now, this is the embolization to the middle meningeal artery. You can see the lateral view. This is the middle meningeal artery supplying the fistula. You can see the draining veins here. And after embolization, you see the cast. You see the middle meningeal artery going up there, and you can see the whole onyx cast and complete obliteration of the AVM, AV fistula on the images post uh, embolization. This is again uh, a similar patient with the fistula in the torcular area supplied by the occipital artery, hypoglossal branch. There's a middle meningeal artery and the posterior meningeal artery. Now, you do see this is the occipital artery here, and you can see the hypoglossal branch going up and then back into the fistula. And you see most of the venous drainage appears again to the contralateral hemisphere here. See, this was the initial attempt. We uh, bent into that occipital artery branch, which was going into the hypoglossal area, and embolized it with onyx. You could see that we did get into the fistula, but at the end of the procedure, the draining vein is still present. Now, the middle meningeal artery contribution to it was much smaller. You can see it's just a tiny filamentous branch leading to it. See, this is the middle meningeal artery. But we were able to get into this branch and then inject the onyx, which eventually resulted in complete obliteration of it. And so this is the final image. You can see the middle meningeal artery embolization, which is a fine branch here. This was the branch of the occipital artery here. And you can see there is no more contralateral drainage. So we were able to take care of the problem, again, through the middle meningeal artery. This is a patient who presented again with a convexity dural AV fistula. You can see that uh, he is 72 years old. He came in with a frontal hemorrhage and had a Borden type 3, which was fed by the middle meningeal artery. And uh, here what you see is the middle meningeal artery going up. And you can see again, it is going all the way to the sinus in the midline. And from the sinus, the fistula point, the, the draining vein goes laterally. See on the lateral image, you see this draining vein. So this is the sinus, and you see the draining vein here. And as it comes down, you can see all this venous ectasia and finally draining through a larger vein. So this is a middle meningeal artery onyx cast, and you can see how the onyx penetrates into that sagittal sinus, and then it goes down into the into that big draining vein we saw. Now, one thing interesting you see is you see this along the sagittal sinus, and you wonder whether the sagittal sinus itself will get occluded. But actually, a lot of this is actually in the wall of the sagittal sinus, so the, probably the, the sinus itself stays patent. That's one thing you see with many of these fistulas. Though it can drain into the sinus, uh, a significant portion of that fistula and the draining vein may be just lining the wall as a parallel conduit. Now, this is another patient who presented with, again, a transverse sinus fistula. And here, she had a supply coming from the middle meningeal artery. And you can see all these filamentous vessels here. There was some supply from the occipital artery, and then it drains into this transverse sinus, sorry, into the sigmoid sinus, and then into the jugular vein. Now, the initial attempt was with the middle meningeal artery, and you can see how this was embolized. But what we didn't see at the time of the embolization is that a portion of this onyx migrated into the petrosal sinus, or sorry, into the petrosal vein. And you can see that uh, there is some onyx here. I'm not sure whether this is magnified enough for you to see, but there is definitely some onyx here. And you can see what happened as a result of it. The patient had a venous infarct of the cerebellum and the middle cerebellum, a portion of the brainstem.
So this is one of the complications we had. And um, it's because this area was busy and uh, the, the, we did not quickly see the onyx migrating into this area. This is again a patient who presented with a posterior fossa dura levi fistula, predominantly supplied by the middle meningeal artery, the occipital artery, and the posterior meningeal artery. And you can see this fistula supplies the cerebellum here. This is the posterior aspect of the cerebellum. And you can see numerous veins in the cerebellum and a final large draining vein here. So again, it was embolized through the um, middle meningeal artery, and you can see how there is some onyx here. So we first went into one of the branches, and so you can see that branch is blocked here, and then there was a second branch. So we went into the second branch, and at that point, we had a perforation of the middle meningeal artery. We were able to embolize it, but um, the patient didn't have any symptoms from it, and we were able to completely obliterate the fistula. So in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that um, the transarterial onyx embolization is simple, and it's effective with a very high cure rate. Now, the ideal artery to embolize is the middle meningeal artery. And why is that? One, it's easily accessible. It's uh, a branch of the external cord artery, so there is less risk rather than trying to do something for an in, in, to the internal cord artery. The second reason is it's within the dura itself. So it does not have to penetrate the bone if you inject onyx to get to the fistula compared to the occipital artery, which is very, in, very involved in the supply of this dura levi fistulas. But a lot of the feeders eventually have to go transosseous. And so when you inject onyx, uh, it does not penetrate the skull as well. Uh, part of it, some of it has been obviated by, or uh, some of that problem has been eliminated by the use of septa balloon. So you inflate the balloon and you inject the onyx so that you can force the onyx to the transosseous feeders. But in my experience, I've never still found it to be as effective as, the, um, as using the middle meningeal artery. And the second problem is um, the occipital artery has collaterals with the um, posterior circulation. So you have to be careful that when you inject onyx through the septa, it doesn't reflux all the way back in the vertebral basilar system or go into some location where you don't want it to go. We have to be careful that uh, to avoid onyx migration in the intact veins uh, because you saw what happens when it gets into an intact vein. You can get a venous infarct. And similarly, you have to uh, avoid dangerous anastomosis. Now, especially with the middle meningeal artery, an anastomosis would include uh, uh, supply to uh, other cranial nerves. Now, let's go on to talk about multimodal treatment of intracranial dural artery venous fistulas with cortical venous reflux. Um, now, we have taken an approach where this, this, this is our approach for patients with cortical venous drainage. So, this is a very high risk group. So, you'll see that when you have that, we had 80 patients in, in this group. Uh, you can see that the dural arteriovenous fistula with cortical venous reflux were predominantly treated through a transarterial embolization. See, 62 out of the 80. Seven of them were treated primarily through transvenous embolization, and 12 of them went directly to surgery. Now, you can see that the ones that had transvenous embolization and surgery were successful. Um, now, the transarterial embolization was not equally successful because you can see that some of them then required additional treatment. So let's look at these numbers carefully. So of the transarterial embolization, 
72% were cured. The rest um, had to go to other treatments. So 45 out of the 62 were cured. The rest, six of them were observed. Now these are patients who would have had a recent embolization. For example, you had cortical venous drainage, which was taken down, but they may still have some additional supply, which is which would have converted them from a Borden type two or type three to a Borden type one. And one of these patients was lost to follow up. Five of them are still doing fine. Now, some of them they still had dangerous drainage, so three of them went on to transvenous embolization, which was again successful. So you can see seven plus three, all the transvenous embolization was successful, successful in curing the AV fistula. And then of this, you can see uh, of the 11 patients that were still left, two went to, uh, sorry, of the 11 patients, three went to transvenous, leaving you eight patients, of which two were treated with radio surgery. And um, complete obliteration in one patient and loss to follow up one patient. And six of those patients went on to surgical intervention. And these were curative. So you may ask, why not do transvenous and surgical intervention rather than um, try transarterial? Because it's almost 100% curative. I think the surgical intervention always requires open surgery, and I feel like it is reasonable to start with the less invasive endovascular approach first. The venous approach, uh, I think, has to be reserved for special cases because sometimes uh, getting into the veins, like some of those tortuous uh, cerebellar veins that I showed you on the previous image, is not easy. So. So we still prefer a transarterial approach as the first line approach. Now, I want to show you some of the patients who went on to direct surgical intervention without any kind of um, endovascular approach. And you'll see the vast majority of them were anterior cranial fossa dural AV fistulas. Now, the reason for that is a lot of them are supplied to the ophthalmic artery. And though there have been reports of embolization to the ophthalmic artery, I think there is some risk to that, risk of vision loss, embolizing to the ophthalmic artery. Though you're trying to target the distal vessels after the retinal artery has come off. <clears throat> so I think if you have an anterior cranial fossa force fistula, I think a transvenous uh, approach or surgery would be the choice. And the problem with the transvenous approach is sometimes you have to go through very tortuous veins to get there. Whereas with surgery, it's more straightforward. You do a anterior fossa craniotomy, you retract the frontal lobe, and you see the draining vein right away. <clears throat> with the tentorial venous drainage, it's a little different. <clears throat> sometimes When you come to the tentorial drainage, what you find is that um, sometimes there is just a large draining vein, and if you do a retrosigmoid craniectomy or a craniotomy, you can find it at the petrous uh, or coming off the petrous bone, and you just have to coagulate it. So that's another indication where you could just do a straightforward surgery. So we looked at the angioarchitecture of these dual AV fistulas, which prevent us from endovascular embolization and requiring surgery. So if it's transarterial, if the dominant feeding vessel comes from the ophthalmic artery, the meningohypophyseal trunk, the posterior meningeal artery, the PL artery, or ascending pharyngeal artery, then endovascular embolization can be difficult. Uh, I just want to go over some specific cases here. So if the ophthalmic artery, you know, it, because the retinal artery comes off it, you don't want to embolize through that. The meningohypophyseal trunk, the problem is the origin is very tortuous and it's very hard to can cannulate it. Similarly, the posterior meningeal artery has a very tortuous origin. 
and again, it's hard to cannulate. The peel artery, the problem is the peel artery fistulas are very rare. It's very rarely that you see a peel vessel supplying a dual navy fistula, but when that happens, what happens is you want the onyx, which is what we primarily use, to reflux back before it enters the fistula, or we create a plug. And with the peel artery, you don't have a sufficient margin of error there because as the artery, as the onyx reflux back, you may be um, so you may be taking down vessels that are supplying uh, portions of the brain. The ascending pharyngeal artery we have used, but you have to be careful because some of the branches do supply cranial nerves. And you have to be distal enough when you embolize to the ascending pharyngeal artery. And coming to, to cortical venous uh, embolization to the, to the venous pathway, I think if you have a very tortuous cortical vein, or if the venous drainage is deep, then it's hard to cannulate it because there's a risk. And the risk is as you cannulate it with the catheter and microwire, if you perforate it, you're in an area which is not easily accessible and you can get uh, bleeding under, it's an arterialous vein that's going to bleed and that's a high pressure bleed. So it's not like a normal venous bleed. <coughs> And the other situation is where you have an isolated sinus. When you have an isolated sinus, the veins don't connect. So you, you basically, the fistula drains into this isolated sinus, and I'll show you an example. And there we you tend to use a more hybrid approach. So this is an example of a patient with an isolated sinus. Who is, this is a 44-year-old male who came in with a seizure. And you can see that the left temporal lobe is edematous. The other interesting you see, uh, the interesting feature you see on the MRI is all these trans arterial or um, these blood vessels, these are tortuous corkscrew like vessels that seem to go through the temporal lobe. And so this is the angiogram. And what you see through the angiogram is that there is a fistula which is supplied by branches of the. Um, <coughs> the vertebral artery, like the posterior meningeal, the branches of the occipital artery here, and the venous drainage seems to be into the transverse sinus, which seems to be isolated, and through a vein of Lebe. So I think here you have two options, really. You could go through the posterior auricular branch and try to get the onyx into this, and, or, go transvenous into this. With the transvenous, you see how it's kind of tortuous. You have to get all the way through the sagittal sinus, come down here. And so we elected to do the transarterial approach first. But after we had done the transarterial approach, it was still persistent. So at that point, what we did is we just did a small craniotomy here and just um, found that vein of Lebe and just clipped it. And the reason why that is safe is because the that vein of Lebe that we saw earlier, and I'm going to show it to you again, this is an arterialized vein of Lebe. And it is unlikely to be supplying the normal brain because the venous pressure is so high. The brain has figured out its own ways to function or drain and function normally. So putting a Putting a clip or ligating this is a fairly simple, straightforward procedure to cure the fistula. Once you do that, all the supply to that just thrombosis will solve. Now, this is a patient who came in with, uh, he's a 44-year-old male who came in with a posterior fossa hemorrhage that required both embolization surgery. Uh, and you can see what we did is, uh, the patient comes in with a hematoma, so we did surgery to evacuate it. And then what you realize is a lot of that fish that was supplied to the tentorial branches. And this is what I was telling you earlier. The tentorial branches seem to be very complex. And um, getting past to all these tortuous vessels to embolize it is hard. 
and you can see the draining vein is going into the deep venous drainage, and you can see the straight sinus uh, filling up here, the vein of Galen and the straight sinus. Uh, it also had, interestingly, supply from the middle meningeal artery. You can see the middle meningeal artery supply. So my first thought was, why not do surgery? But I think the deep location and this large venous pouch here I thought surgery would be a little more challenging, so we actually did embolize it. This is the this is the venous pouch in the infratentorial region, and um, so we used the tentorial branch. We were able to get in and we embolized it, but it was not a hundred percent successful. And so this is this is the final result of the embolization and the craniectomy. And so. Still, the patient still had the fistula, and you can see it was still supplied by some branches of the occipital artery, and there was some supply from the middle meningeal artery. You don't see it in this image, but you can see that the venous pouch is still present, and it's draining into the deep venous system. So at this point, we were able to go to the middle meningeal artery, get into this pouch, and then just coil it off. So this resulted in complete obliteration of the fistula. And the reason is that venous pouch is where all these feeders are draining into. So by taking down the venous pouch, you basically cured the dural AV fistula. And this is the final post-embolization angiogram. You see this, you can see how all those tentorial branches have thrombosed off. Similarly, uh, all the branches from the occipital artery supplying it have thrombosed off. So once you take down the pouch, all the feeding vessels thrombose. This is a patient who presented with an anterior cranial dual AV fistula. And here what you see is the dual AV fistula is supplied by branches of the ophthalmic artery, and it drains into this large cortical venous drainage. Now, this drain eventually goes up. And so here we were able to get into the sagittal sinus and come down and then just take onyx to take down the fistula. The patient had a previous aneurysm that was coiled. So, like I said, when you have an anterior cranial fossa dural AV fistula, you could either treat it through open surgery through an anterior fossa craniotomy or you could just do a transvenous embolization. Now, this is another situation where you have a large fistula in the anterior cranial fossa, but actually it also goes into the cavernous sinus. And there's a draining vein here. So, and the, you can see that the draining vein also goes posteriorly. So in this situation, what we have done is we have um, gone transvenous through the sagittal sinus, through the draining vein, and then gone down all the way into the paracavernous sinus here. And we have uh, obliterated the fistula using the using a coiling method. And you can see how this is the, the coils in the, in the paracavernous sinus, and this is the final angiogram. This is an example of a surgical treatment of a partially embolized torcular dural AVF. So this is a dural arteriovenous fistula. This is in the torcula. And you can see this patient had present with hemorrhage. And you see the posterior meningeal artery, the origin, right, is very tortuous. So it was very hard to embolize it properly. Uh, we did embolize it to some of the branches, and you can see the onyx cast, but it was still present. And uh, see, so this is a post transarterial embolization images. You can see the onyx here, but there's still that draining vein. So here, uh, we did a suboccipital craniectomy and just ligated this draining vein. And this is the post-surgical image. You can see that the draining vein is no longer patent. This is an example of an anterior cranial fossa fistula that we elected to treat with uh, surgery as an upfront treatment. As you can see, there is the anterior cranial fossa fistula directly fed by the ophthalmic artery. Uh, 
And what you see is that the venous drainage is more posterior, and it goes into the deep venous system and into the basal vein of Rosenthal. The problem with that is it's very tortuous to get all the way up there. And there's some risk to navigating your catheter and wire through all those venous channels. So here we elected to do a, a, an anterior cranial fossa craniotomy and just ligate the vein as it came out of the cribriform plate. And you can see how the fistula is completely obliterated. This is an example of a tentorial duralavy fistula. As I mentioned before, the supply is predominantly coming from the internal core artery, and you can see how the venous drainage is right at the petrous apex here. And um, the venous drainage is into the cortical veins of the cerebellum. There's no way we can get into this transvenously up to this point to coil it. And the transarterial embolization is a problematic thing. So here what we did is a small vitrosic craniotomy, and we were able to just ligate this vein. It's just like a trigeminal neurology operation. You see the vein there, and you just uh, ligated it. So, and you can see this is a post-operative image. So this is another example where you can use surgical treatment as an upfront treatment. Now, what about combined endovascular and surgical treatment? So this usually is attempted when there is an isolated sinus, and this would be an example. You can see that this patient has multiple arterial feeders. They come from the middle meningeal artery, the occipital artery, and it all drains into this transverse sinus and the sigmoid sinus. But see, it's isolated. It's hard to get here because there's no large vein that drains into this area. So here what we have done is we have created a small um, craniotomy or a burr hole. We have cannulated the sinus directly and then closed the incision and then gone ahead and then just coiled that transverse sinus. And this is the post-operative imaging. So you can see how that uh, fistula was completely obliterated. So the take home message here is, though endovascular therapies have assumed the predominant modality of treatment for these lesions, there is a role for surgical treatment in selected cases uh, which uh, where the endovascular, where the arterial supply hampers endovascular treatment. Now I want to move on to a different area, carotid cavernous fistulas. I want to start with a new classification that we have proposed to using on venous drainage. Now, traditionally, carotid cavernous fistula are classified based on arterial supply which is the barrel classification. The problem with barrel classification is that the symptomatology and treatment approach is dictated by the venous drainage, not by the arterial drainage, arterial supply. And therefore, we felt that a more updated classification system utilizing venous drainage was needed. So, the barrel classification, as you know, type A is the high, high, high flow fistula, usually after trauma. Type B is the low flow fistula supplied by dual branches. Type C is to the external cord artery branches. And type D is to internal cord and external cord artery dual branches. Again, one other issue with this classification is most of the fistulas we see are low flow fistulas and they're supplied by the ICA and the ECA. I have rarely seen a CCA fistula which is supplied just by the ICA or the ECA. So if you, though there is a classification, most of these fistulas will just fall under type D, except for the occasional um, direct fistulas that we see. So I feel that this classification also doesn't differentiate between the different kinds of fistulas. The cavernous sinus has numerous ways to drain. Uh, 
if you look at a pictorial description, you can see there are 12 different pathways, including the superior ophthalmic vein, the inferior ophthalmic vein, the pterygoid plexus, the superior and inferior petrosal sinus, the spherop sphenoparietal sinus, etc. If it drains to the superior ophthalmic vein, then one finds the classic description of um, the CC fistula, which is exophthalmos, um, proptosis, brui, etc. And one of the things to also remember is a, a significant portion of the cavernous sinus is posterior to the internal carotid artery. And the cranial nerves, the orbit, the third cranial nerve, the fourth and sixth, course through these areas. And you might find um, symptoms associated with that dysfunction, uh, predominantly diplopia. This is conjunctival chemosis, just from congestion. So when one thinks of approaches to carotid cavernous fistula, you can go transvenously through an inferior petrosal sinus, through the superior ophthalmic vein via a transfemoral route, or a direct surgical exposure of the superior ophthalmic vein, or a facial vein via a transfemoral route, or transarterial route. And based on this, we proposed the venous classification. This was published in Journal of Neurosurgery in two thousand sorry in, in the Journal of Neurosurgery in 2015. And this has subsequently been validated by an Italian group from Florence, Nicola Limbucci's group. Um, and what it what we did is we we split it into five different categories. So based on the drainage. So if you had posterior inferior drainage, if you had posterior inferior and anterior drainage, anterior drainage only, and retrograde drainage into cortical veins with or without other drainage, these were designated as types one, two, three, and four. And carotid cavernous fistula, which involved a direct connection between internal cord artery and cavernous sinus, which is like a barrow type A, was denominated as type five. Our initial paper just looked at 29 carotid cavernous fistulas. And this is again the classification. So type one is just posterior inferior drainage. These would predominantly present with uh, cranial neuropathies, usually the diplopia. Uh, posterior inferior and anterior drainage. Anterior drainage would produce uh, proptosis, chemo, uh, conjunctival chemosis. Anterior drainage only. Retrograde drainage into cortical veins with other routes of venous drainage. And type five was a high flow direct shunt between cavernous internal cord artery and cavernous sinus which is a Barrett type A, and that, those are associated with multiple routes of venous drainage. So again, type one, you can see the drainage is, uh, so this is the carotid artery, internal carotid artery, external carotid artery, multiple venous channels, and the predominant venous drainage is into the posterior area, inferior petrosal sinus. They can also drain uh, into some of the other sinuses, for example, the uh, pterygoid plexus of veins, and these patients usually present with cranial neuropathies, and treatment is directed to the inferior petrosal sinus. So this is an example of a type 1 fistula. You can see that there is a fistula that's supplied by branches of the internal cord artery and some branches of the external cord artery. Predominant venous drainage is into the cavernous sinus here, and then you can see the inferior petrosal sinus here and the jugular uh, vein. Uh, you can see this better now on the contralateral injection. You see how it drains into the opposite side. And even on this side, there is a fistula. So there is bilateral fistula. And you see the enlarged superior ophthalmic vein here. But it's, the drainage is not predominantly through it. The drainage is predominantly through the posterior cavernous sinus. Type 2 would be where you have uh, a posterior and inferior drainage and anterior drainage simultaneously. So you have drainage into the inferior petrosal sinus and you have drainage into the ophthalmic veins 
Uh, and these patients present with both cranial neuropathy and ocular symptoms. By ocular symptoms, I mean um, increased uh, venous congestion, high intraocular pressures, conjunctival chemosis, diminished visual acuity. And these patients can be either treated through the inferior petrosal sinus or through the superior ophthalmic vein. Type 3 is drained just into the superior or inferior ophthalmic veins, and the patients present with ocular symptoms only. Here, we have to treat through the superior ophthalmic vein most often because there may not be a channel that connects the inferior petrosal sinus into this venous drainage. I just want to show you an example. This is a patient who had um, um, a superior ophthalmic who had a type 3, and you can see how there is exophthalmos on the right side. And you can see that there is uh, conjunctival chemosis. Look at the enhancement right here. And this is a picture of um, the, uh, this is an image of the superior ophthalmic vein massively dilated. And you can see how it's draining into the facial vein. And so here, instead of exposing the superior ophthalmic vein, we essentially expose the um, facial vein at the angle of the mandible, and then we cannulated it with a forefront short sheet, and we were able to directly access the superior ophthalmic vein. And then we went all the way back into the cavernous sinus here, and we, co we coiled it. And you can see post-embolization, there's no evidence of the dual AV fistula. So that's a type 3. Type 4 is cortical venous drainage in association with other venous drainage. So you can see there is retrograde cortical venous drainage, and you could also have other sources of drainage. Now, this patient, you could actually treat to the inferior petrosal sinus. And the patients can present with multiple symptoms, uh, especially with cortical symptoms of either hemorrhage or cortical dysfunction. This is an example of a patient with a cortical venous drainage. You can see that this patient has drainage uh, into the opposite transverse, uh, into the opposite cavernous sinus. And we had initially uh, uh, seen this patient, and you can see that there was some drainage into the opposite cavernous sinus. But from here, it takes, it drains into the cortical veins. This appears to be a sylvian vein, and the patient then presented with a seizure and a venous infarct. And you can see how it corresponds to the area of the um, venous drainage here. See, this is again in the right sylvian area, and the infarct is in just above the sylvian fissure on the right side. And so uh, the right inferior petrosal sinus was occluded. So we went into the left inferior petrosal sinus, into the cavernous sinus, um, and you can see the image here. So we went across into the opposite side, coiled this area, and then came back to the intercavernous sinus and coiled the cavernous sinus on the left. This is the final image of the coils. And um, so this is the pre-op image. And this is a post-op. So you can see the post-embolization image has no evidence of uh, CC fistula. So that's a type 4. Now type 5 is a direct fistula. And these are, as I mentioned, uh, very problematic because of the multiple channels. And this is a, a young woman who presented with um, trauma. And you can see that both superior ophthalmic veins are massively dilated. And when you do an angiogram, this is what you see. You see the entire jugular vein and the cavernous sinus filling up just on the common carotid injection. And you can see both sides. So it's a high flow fistula. Again, you see the superior ophthalmic vein massively dilated on both sides. And so initially we treated this to the inferior uh, petrosal sinus. You can see this. It's the inferior petrosal sinus, the superior ophthalmic vein. And so you can see the coil mass here. And we wanted to just reduce the intraocular pressure, So, which is why we did this. Um, 
but and this is the immediate post embolization image and the patient's uh, fistula was uh, i mean the intraocular pressures dropped substantially but then uh, one week later when i did a follow up angiogram you can see now that the flow has been redirected into the cortical veins and also multiple other channels so at this point uh, we felt that we should take down the carotid artery in the cavernous segment uh, where the fistula was so what we did is we did a balloon test occlusion. You can see the balloon in the internal coral artery. And uh, after occluding it, we, and the patient didn't have any symptoms. And so we then went ahead and took down the uh, cavernous carotid. And also these are amplatzer coils in the, amplatzer plots in the internal coral artery. This is a post-operative, post-embolization image. Uh, the internal cord artery is completely taken down. There's no evidence of any fistula. Uh, and then you can see the uh, MRA done after that shows uh, extensive collaterals from the left side and to the vertebral basal system, but the right hemisphere fills well. And the patient did uh, well uh, eventually. Recently, we have also tried a newer technique for treating these, which is a combination of a flow diverter and uh, coils. If you just use coils alone uh, by going through the communication and coiling the venous side, uh, they do tend to reopen. So this is an example of an 85-year-old patient who came in with a small left frontal hemorrhage and was found to have a CC fistula, which is more like a type 1. You can see this is a fistula right in the cavernous carotid. So we uh, placed a pipeline flow diverter you can see here, along with, adju adju uh, with adjunct coiling. And you can see how the internal cord artery is patent and the fistula is no longer present. And the patient is doing well uh, despite her, uh, her um, advanced age. So in general, when we looked at the new classification, what we found was that the, the way we have classified it into five types they correspond very well with the symptoms, with the significance, which was quite good. Same with the treatment approach. Again, the new classification corresponded to it. And uh, the outcomes, you know, not as much, but very close. So in, in other words, the if your symptoms and treatment approach are dictated by this classification, we felt that a venous drainage-based classification would be better. And even with the Italian group, which subsequently validated this, they found that it seemed to be better than the other classification systems. So in conclusion, this is um, dural AV fistulas are a very fascinating uh, uh, group of problems to deal with. And one has to tailor the approach based on the arterial supply and venous drainage. And it's not that there's just one solution. It may be a combination of transarterial, transvenous embolization and surgery. Thank you very much for this opportunity once again. Thank you very much, Dr. Thomas, for such a wonderful lecture. So we have a few questions from the public. Uh, the first one is, uh, what therapy options would you recommend for a barotype type D carotid cavernous fistula? So barrow type B would be, depends on what, uh, so that's why the problem I have is just saying barrow type B would be that we don't know what it means. Because everything is dependent on venous drainage. Um, if the patient doesn't have any cortical venous drainage or any dangerous patterns of drainage, and if the patient is asymptomatic, then you could just monitor it. You don't necessarily need to treat it. But Let's say the patient came in with conjunctival edema with high intraocular pressure, then you'd have to treat it. And the question is, would you go through the inferior petrosal sinus or to the superior ophthalmic vein? And that would be dependent on uh, how the drainage pattern is. Okay, sir. Uh, so there's another question here. What about those cases when the tip of the catheter does not reach the fistula site do you inject DMSO to fill the catheter only, or you increase the amount to fill the remaining distance of the artery? 
I mean, from the tip of the catheter to the fistula site. No, I just uh, used the dead space of the catheter. Okay, sir. Um, is it possible that in a cortical fistula near the sidal sinus, the embolization material migrate to the sinus and causes a cerebral vein thrombosis? If it can happen, how can you prevent it? So it could potentially happen. So I am kind of careful in the sense that we, so the, the issue is most of these fistulas are occurring in the wall of the sagittal sinus, right? Okay. Embolize it, it's more likely to get into the uh, fistula and the drain into the cortical veins rather than directly into the sagittal sinus. If you have a fistula which goes just into the sagittal sinus, it's anti-grade. And uh, you, know, you don't have to treat it because the risk of treating it may be higher. If you want to treat it and you want to prevent the kind of complication you described going into a normal cortical vein, there are new balloons uh, made by ball, which, are, which you can use. You can inflate it in the sagittal sinus, and then you do the embolization, so that way it doesn't go in anywhere else. Okay. Uh, do you use any other embolizing agent other than onyx? We, uh, we, we used NBCA long ago, uh, but um, you know, what has happened is we found that we've gotten very good with onyx and we use it for a lot of other purposes, you know, brain tumor embolization, spinal med embolization. So um, we have come to use NBC. We, I haven't used NBCA in the last five years. Uh, obviously the new uh, kid on the block is squid uh, we haven't started using squid yet, uh, but they say it's good and we look forward to using it. Okay, sir. When do you put a balloon into a sinus during a dural AVF embolization? So the commonest uh, situation where we use it is in the torcula. Um, so when we have a, dural, a transverse sinus dural AV fistula and we're embolizing it, so imagine a situation where there is multiple blood vessels coming from the occipital artery. And we're worried that we could, so let's say that one sign, both sinuses are co-dominant. We could end, we could take, we could accept losing one sinus, but not both. So that's a situation where we would use the balloon. The other situation where we use a balloon is like a septic balloon when you inject the occipital artery. So if you have a septa balloon in the occipital artery and you inject onyx, uh, and if you inflate the balloon, it's very likely that the onyx will um, penetrate the transosseous uh, pseudo as well, like a pressure cooker technique. I think it's been well described. Okay, sir. How do you define when to stop embolization therapy during a single session? What parameters are taken into account? Size, reflux, ecstasy? The only parameter we use is uh, the draining vein should be done. So as soon as onyx gets into the draining vein and that is complete, then we stop. So that would be for patients who have cortical venous reflux. It's a little more challenging when it is a type one Borden or a cornea type one or one, two A, because there the symptom is mainly that of tinnitus and in my experience. And the question is, when do you stop, right? Because if you're too aggressive, you could actually get a facial neuropathy or a lower cranial neuropathy. And so you have to use judgment there. And um, it is uh, hard for me to describe. I, I think you would do it case by case but I feel that when you have enough feeders taken down, uh, you would stop. Thank you, sir. And the last question, for an anterior cranial fossa dural AVF, what is the first treatment option, surgery or endovascular? Uh, we have generally tended to use surgery, um, as you can see, but um, recently we have gone transvenous also. I think if you have a straight shot, if, for example, if the, if the cortical vein that drains into the superior sagittal sinus is straight, not tortuous, you can get into easily, 
then I think you can avoid surgery. The only thing I would caution is uh, instead of going transfemorally, better to puncture the jugular vein because that way your catheters will all be able to reach uh, the point where you want to do the work. On behalf of CN, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Thomas. This has been a remarkable lecture. We're really grateful and honored for your participation on the 2020 IWBNC. You're more than welcome to stay tuned and to watch the next lectures from other speakers. In a few minutes, we'll have Dr. Koithan doing his lecture, the case, the case against Peak for ACDF. To get the link for this upcoming conference, Please follow the link pinned on the chat screen or check the agenda on our website, cnhus.com. Thank you again, Dr. Thomas. Thank you very much.